those moments in your life when you realize, I need to think about things differently. Um, I don't know if you know this, but every Labor Day weekend, um, there is something called Nazarene Nationals. It's a softball tournament. How many of you knew that? That's what I thought. There's people playing their hearts out for you this weekend and you don't even know. And um, so I'm going to play in Nazarene Nationals yesterday, right? And uh, hey, I'll be fine. Five games later, 90 degree heat. I have this epiphany that, you know what? I don't think I can do this anymore. (laughs) My wife is right. I need to stop thinking I'm 35 or 25. And so, man, if I'm like tied to the podium today, it's because I'm sore. The crazy thing is I got to go back and do it tomorrow morning. So we'll see if I survive. But, um, you know, we have biology, psychology, theology, right? That's a pretty big one. What, why can't we have relationology? How many of you think that's a word? You guys are super smart. No one voted that way. Guess what? I thought I was so clever. I was so creative. And I I put this word together. I Googled it and found out it's not a word. It's not a word. And actually, people have already used it. There's a book out there right now called Relationology. And so I'm not near as creative as I think I am. But we're going to make it a word for the next two months, okay? Relationships truly are the most valuable thing we have. You know, we just came through a series called Sent and how that fits into the great plan of God. Go and make disciples with our lives. That's part of what he has planned for us. And I want to spend time in the great plan of God on that that part of where God calls us to love our neighbor as ourself. We find it easy, I think, if there's three parts to that, love God, love others, make disciples. I think we find it easy to obsess over the loving God part. And we spend a lot of energy and time and focus on devotionally learning more about God, interacting with God, worshiping God, and rightly so. But I have found in my own life that if I've given myself to that so much, I forgot and not realized that equally important And the fruit of loving God is how we love one another. Do you remember Jesus? We just celebrated communion that night in which he he did communion. He, um, he, He said these words, a new command I give you. This is a big deal to Jesus Christ. This is like last words. I you gotta get this. This is what I'm trying to do in your life. That you love one another. In fact, he would go on to say this, by this all men will know that you're mine, that you're my disciples, by what? Your knowledge, your power? No, your love for one another. You know, relationships become this place where we experience the richness and quality of life God has planned. And it is also the laboratory by which a lost world sees the life-changing grace of God. And so for this series, we're going to walk through what I would say is like the Magna Carta of relationships in the Bible, Romans chapter 12. You see, Romans is this this hugely influential book in scripture. It's one of those that we go to so often to understand so much about the story of man, the story of God, the salvation of God. It's, it's where we go often to understand such rich truths like therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. It's the place that we know that there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. It's a place that we, we read that all things work together for good to them that love God and called according to his purpose. It's the place where we read if God be for us who can be against us um, it's a place where there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus and I could just keep going on for 11 chapters Paul just is like hey this is what's going on this is what you need to know this is what you need to trust in this is what you need to throw everything on and then after he's done that for 11 chapters so thoroughly helped us understand what we need to know 
It's like he goes, all right, now I want you to understand if this is what, what you have and who you are, and this is what God planned, this is what it looks like. And you know, the first place he goes to in our lives when he talks about what it looks like for God's plan, our relationships. Romans chapter 12, it's like, okay, this is what I have for you. And this is what I, how I want you to live. And this is the place where it starts in relationships. As we walk through this series, I, I want us to know that there's, there's words that I want us to guide how we understand what healthy relationships look like. That in these 21 verses, is, it's just such a beautiful, uh, uh, can I say treaties? Does anybody even know what I mean when I say treaties? That's kind of like a 19... 19- hundreds word, but it's just, it's, it's just such a cool, that's a good word, right? That's 21st century. Uh, don't get me started on using words. My kids get very frustrated with me because I try to be cool and say the modern words and they're like, dad, that just doesn't look good. You're not cool. Stop doing it. You're 44. So don't use dip and all these words, you know, like Ask one of your teenagers what dip means now. I didn't know that's what it meant. But, um, um, you know, like, it's just such a beautiful uh, exposition of relationships. And in that, we see words like this. Humility. Role. Authentic. Devoted. Selfless. Empathy. Peaceable resolved. And what I want us to do is as we walk through these verses that, that bring out these words, my hope is that the Spirit of God will continue to speak into our heart as we read this every Sunday, as we look at it every Sunday, as I hope maybe that you'll pick this up throughout your weeks and, and start just read 21 verses. This is like relationships, what God is calling us to, that these words, God will start to use this to help you to understand these are the values your relationships need to have. I mean, humility empathy, peaceable, resolved, so many words. And I want to take these words and also overlay them over our marriages, our families, our kids, parenting, our church community, our, our neighbors, our work environment. How do these words, what do they look like in our lives in these relationships? And will I allow my heart and mind to realize that for healthy, life-giving, rich relationships, that I should operate out of these values and truths. But what's so cool about the Lord is like he's gonna move into this, but there's this transitional two verses. I'm gonna show you what relationships should look like, but I wanna make sure you understand that if you're gonna live this out Here's the stage that I'm going to set. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. If you have your scriptures or you have your phone or whatever you use or look on the screen, Paul would say this, therefore, in light of everything I've said, I urge you, and this is a strong word, I'm begging you guys. This is like um, a dad on his knees before his child when they're on the verge of making a really stupid decision and they're like, no, please don't do this. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to off, in view of God's mercy, because of what God has done, it, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In July, we talked about this verse. I spent a, a, a number of moments on this verse that, that God is calling us to an all-in lifestyle. If you're wanting to live the life God has planned for you, the abundant, blessed, purpose-filled life, then there is an attitude, there is a place you come where you just, you, you give yourself completely to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Like, you know what? I can't figure this out. I, every time I make a mess of it. And, you know, we, we are very attracted to the ideas of, of forgiveness, right? Amen? I'm in on that. I like the idea that God forgives me because I know I need it. 
right? I needed it. So we're attracted to grace and love and mercy and all those things. And rightly so, God and his love has moved toward us. But so often for people, it's like, that's the end goal. Like if I can just know that the peace of what it is to be forgiven and I can go to God for forgiveness and that must be what this is all about. And I would say that that's just the beginning of what God is calling you into. He's calling you to a relationship with him where he forgives you, accepts you, gives you new life, but it's always with this intended purpose to then take your life and still not struggle with the things that made a mess in the first place. Like he's wanting to change you. He's wanting to, that's why he talks about being a disciple of Jesus. Disciple is, I am following you. You are my Lord. And Romans 12 says, listen, Remember, in view of what God has done and what he is uh, incredible, nothing can separate you from the love of God and all these things, that for you to experience the richness of God's plan, it calls for you to come to a surrender of heart and life where you abandon yourself and follow the lordship of Jesus. Amen? Okay, a few heads nodded. Are we awake? Have I put you to sleep already? Right. It's Labor Day weekend, right? I get it. Like, um, I'm actually moving around this service a little better. I'm starting to feel it. I'm headed to the ball diamond right now. But here's the deal. What's beautiful is in this all in, he continues in this way, verse 12. This is, this is the basis of what we're gonna talk about today. If you're all in, don't conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you will not conform, but you will be transformed and it will change your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His will is good and it's pleasing and it's, purpose, and it's perfect. And so this foundation for God's plan, especially for relationships, is built on this on this foundation of not conforming, but being transformed and being renewed. Those three words, conform, transformed, and renewed. L listen to this. It is the mind in which the, is the arena of where these words need to be lived out. The mind is that mission control panel of a person. And relationships start, healthy, good relationships start with good thinking. Amen? Okay, guess what? The world that you and I live in does not believe that. Good relationships start with feeling, right? So much of our relationships are built on and interact with how we feel toward one another. And, and, and so you have this narrative of, you know, they make me feel good, or I feel good when I'm with them, or I feel like I'm in love with them, or I feel, and the scriptures are saying, wait, 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 you want healthy, life-giving relationships? You need to understand that good, healthy relationships start with good thinking. You know what I'm talking about, come on. Uh, and maybe I'm different, because I, my wife in the room today, yes, she is. I mean, I, before I met the one, I dated a number of ones, right? <laughs> I don't know, I'm not any different than you, right? And there were times that I would date someone and I felt good with them, right? Like the, but I knew in the back of my mind, this is not good for you, right? Like you ever have friends that they're a lot of fun and you have a blast with, and but you know in the back of your mind, what we're doing is not good for me. This is not headed a good direction, right? Like they... Like, I felt like I wanted to be in that moment, but something was telling me you really don't need to be in that moment. You, you get this. And the scriptures are making sure to remind us that relationships are lived out of healthy thinking first. And then you can have all the feels. This is where there's such a contrast between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. 
I mean, listen to this. I've been thinking about, because he's talking to our minds and trying to get our thinking right, once again about the brain. I mean, it's just amazing. Think about this. The weight of the human brain is about three pounds. Do you know that? In fact, your skin weighs twice as much as your brain. That's weird. The brain is actually made up of 75% water. There are 100,000 miles of blood vessels in the brain. Your brain was the same size basically at birth as it is now. It uses 20% of the total oxygen in your body and it uses 20% of the blood circulating in your body. It's an amazing machine. It is unbelievable. I know it's so easy for us to, to look around and we have all these comparison things and performance things in our world. And like, you know, if you're smart, then you get to do this. And we have these levels. And even in school, we're already, people are saying, I'm not very smart or I'm super smart. And we do all this. And I want to say something to you today. Guess what? If you have a brain, <laughs> some of you, that's been the question, right? If you have a brain, you are incredibly smart. Amen. I mean, what God has gifted us with is out of this world. Amen. It's amazing. They say we only use about 10%, right? Some of you think you use 12. <laughs> and some of you think your spouse uses five. I get it. <laughs> like, it's just amazing. And yet, as amazing as this processor is, it's moldable. It's moldable. We are learning this more and more from science that the connections, you can change the way you think. And the scriptures have always known this. Like that's not new to them. That's why there's so much said in scripture about the mind. Mo allow your mind to be molded in a way that becomes a platform for healthy relationships. I think what I keep saying to you is good relationships begin with good thinking. But let's think about these words, conformed, transformed, and renewing. Conformed is this, this word schematic, the word from which we get schematic. It's a compound word. It's an intense word. It literally means to be stamped or molded. It, it could translate it. Stop allowing yourself to be molded by the world. Don't allow your mind to be molded by the world. What is the world? The world is simply the fallen thinking and ideas that belong to the kingdoms of this world. It's this floating mass of ungodly ideas and behaviors that are separated from and are hostile to the will of God. And he is calling us to a non-conformity to the patterns of this world. He's saying, listen, if you want relationships to go how God planned it, it'll be life-giving. Because the world all around us, it's not happening, right? I mean, our world is a mess. There's wars and rumors of wars all the time. Divorce rates are sky high. Um, dysfunction exists everywhere. Social groups are at, 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 like, our relationships are the, like the epicenter of the fallenness of our world. And he's saying, listen, to do it different, you got to think different and you got to be willing to push back on the patterns of the world. Now that's not working, but it's so easy to be grabbed by them and think some of them. And he's saying, listen, don't conform. Some of you like that word nonconformity, don't you? Yeah, I see some of you shaking your head. You thrive in bucking the system. You ever have people like this in your life? My brother-in-law is one of these. I'm serious, man. Like, we can actually believe the same thing and he'll take the opposite position just to argue. Just so he feels like he's the one in the room that didn't conform. Like his whole identity and his, is like, I'm a nonconformist, man. I'm a revolutionary, right? Some of you are like that. Yeah? Yeah? We kind of joke about stuff like this in our culture right now. You know, we sometimes say nonconformists, they can lend themselves to conspiracy theorists, right? That's a whole code word in our, you know, like they just love to live in the controversy, right? Like, have you ever heard this? There is no way we walked on the moon. 
You've heard that discussion, haven't you? Or it was the U.S. government that killed JFK. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> some of you are like bold. 9-11 was manufactured. I'm not trying to make a comment, you know, like, I'm just saying, like, some of you just love to live in this. I'm telling you today that the scriptures actually do call us to be nonconformists. I don't know about conspiracy theorists, but nonconformists. You have absolute permission to look around the world, uh, to look at the world around you and say, that's not working. And in fact, I'm called to something different. Do not be conformed or molded in your mind to the patterns of this world. Transformed. It's this seventh grade science class word, right? It's a metamorphosis. A caterpillar becomes a butterfly. A tadpole becomes a frog. It's this change that happens. And God is actually saying that I can change your mind. We're learning that in science. The scriptures have always known this. That if you're willing, and if you're all in, and if you're willing to not conform and stand there and say, Lord, change me, change the way I think, it can happen. You can, just like a caterpillar changes into a butterfly. That's the word here. God wants to change our minds. I would say this transformation here is not switching from a to-do list of the flesh to a to-do list of the law. It's actually, he's transforming us to live a life that's in the spirit and that exhibits the fruits of the spirit. Amen. It's not instant, it's a process. In fact, the other place this is used is when Paul talks about we, as we behold the glory of the Lord, are being changed into that image from glory to glory to glory. And then that word renewing, it's a complete renovation of thought. It's having your mind altered. It's about the mind. It's not about emotion. We love renovation shows, right? And this is like, hey, if you're willing to not conform, if you're willing to, to allow change to happen, then what God does is come in and very concretely changes the habits and patterns of your thinking. And the house that you live in is different than the house you lived in before. You can see it. It's how you live. It's where you go. So if this is true, I want to invite you to these three words that conform, transform, and renewing kind of, they, they fit with. I would remind you to reject in your thinking, free your minds from destructive thoughts. You know, my favorite part of the circus is, has always been the, can I even say that now? Is it, the circus can't even go on, can it? They've stopped them, and I get some of that, but um, like I'm always, I was always amazed by the tiger cage. Like, 15 Bengal tigers in a space with one man with a whip. If they only knew. One of them in 10 seconds, it's over. And yet 15 of them do whatever the man says. Because they've been trained from being a cub and they, there's a, they know how to trick and create a stronghold in their mind. And they live far below the reality of what's true. They live imprisoned to the idea that the whip or the man is more powerful than they are. You know, rejecting, freeing yourself from the destructive thoughts that exist in our world. They come from, Romans 8 reminds us that those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh re Desires, those who live according in, to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Part of the reason why we might have, to, what we might have to reject is this ongoing tussle of the flesh and the Spirit that Paul talks about. It just doesn't come natural. Like, and it's just not like, oh, I got Jesus in my life. Whew, never have to worry about negative, destructive, critical, judgmental thoughts. Amen? 
fact, sometimes I wonder if Christians struggle with those more than other people. Amen. Like, no, there is, I have to understand that the flesh and the spirit are continuing. Walk in the spirit and do not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Second Corinthians reminds us that I'm afraid, Paul says this, that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Also at play, what's, what's causing us to keep us captive to healthy thinking and conforming us is the enemy of our soul. Satan, he can't force you, but he has made powerful suggestions. He's called the deceiver, the father of lies. It's a story from the beginning. He's casting doubt always on God's goodness, and he's always trying to imprison our minds and our thinking, lock us in negative, critical, judgmental, insecure thinking. And then, obviously, First John would remind us, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life come not from the Father, but from the world. So not only inside and the enemy, but the world's value system around me. It's this, this kind of Mountain Dew, obey your thirst kind of mentality. You just gotta do it. It's like this triple-headed monster of secularism, hedonism, materialism. that are always trying to capture the way we think about things and imprison us that uh, we begin to think if I have this or I do this or I reach this and it's just always imprisoning us. It's molding us and we are called to reject that. The negative thoughts. I don't have what it takes. Everybody, gets, everybody else gets all the breaks. I can't do it. No one appreciates me. The fearful thoughts. It's the end of the world. The discontented thoughts. I wish I had that. I can't be happy without that. The critical thoughts. Can you believe? I don't like. The thoughts about your past. We obsess over the negative events in our past and we don't allow transformation to happen in the present. It's why this verse is so crucial. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought. That word take captive is like somebody with a spear taking a captive. And it is you can control what you think. You can. Well, let me say that a little different. I have some really crazy ideas that go through my mind. Anybody else? I can't control that. Like, why don't you just jump off this high building? Like, this is crazy. See if you can fly, you know? My grandma always said, listen, you can't help if a bird flies over your head. You can stop the bird from making a nest. This is the kind of idea. It is, it is, the scripture is saying this moldable thing that is your mind, you have the ability through will your will and the spirit infusing your will to say, I reject those negative thoughts. I take captive and make it obedient to Christ. It's why in Colossians, he would say this, set your mind on things above. It's the kind of take control of your thoughts, set, fix, take captive your thinking. Do not conform. You don't have to conform. You can reject the patterns of this world. Second word is reprogram, the transforming thing. Feed my mind, feed our minds on truth. You know, Jesus in his temptation said this, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Transformation happens when we begin to download the truth of scripture. And if I want to think about relationships the way God wants me to, I reject the patterns of this world and I make myself available to download. You know how it is? Like if you've, if you've got something on your computer and it just, it's there because it, it, it's, you know, it's the way you navigate and you, and if you put it in the trash bin, it's gone and then you can put different stuff in that help you navigate through. It's like trash the stuff and download the word of God and allow it to begin the transforming process.
process. The third world is replace. Focus our minds on the right things. That even as we're being transformed and rejecting, there is this, okay, what am I going to do? Walk around with nothing going on here? Like, listen to the words Paul shares in Philippians. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about, think about, dwell is the word here. Actually, it's the same word that's used of a cow chewing its cud. That is really helpful. <laughs> that's gross. But it is saying, you know how they just chew, you know, that's gross. Dwell on these things. Yeah. My favorite line from a movie one of my favorite lines from the movie is from Karate Kid. Your focus need more focus. <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I, that's true in my life. My focus need more focus. I, I will admit that. But it's a way of saying, listen, you can grab a hold of your mind. You can reject. You can download. But then you also, in that place, you focus on right, true, noble, praiseworthy Think, dwell on these things. You see, good, healthy relationships begin when our minds are healthy and renewed. He's saying, listen, I want to take you down this chapter of good relationships, but you got to get your thinking straight or it'll never work because you'll still be thinking about relationships from a worldly point of view. You won't, and so... It doesn't work because what creeps in is selfishness, is insecurities, all these things that God is trying to eliminate. Sound good? Amen. This is what God is calling us to. Relationships begin when our minds are willing to reject destructive thoughts, reprogram ourselves with the word of God, and replace the negative thoughts with focusing on the right things. And that's my hope going forward for us as we walk through this series. I'm gonna do something a little different today and finish. The church is a, uh, it's a unique organization. Um, it operates as an organization in many ways, doesn't it? Uh, there's th things that are organizational in nature, but the community of believers is called to relationships that become family, right? This is more than just an organization. It's a family. God calls the church his family. We realize that Lima community is, is but a small part of the family, and we realize the family has many places and roles, and like, we're, we're part of that family here, but sometimes people in our, in our immediate family go to another part of the family, right? Like we get that. We don't just think we're the only family. And because we're family, I think I really want you, to, I wanna take a moment and help you understand what is happening here in this season of our family. I kinda wanna give you that family update, or as my family calls it, a family meeting. You know, I've spent this first year doing my best <laughs> to discern where we are at as a church and where the Lord wants to take us in the next chapter. I am obsessed, and my only desire is to see the kingdom thrive and advance in this town and this community. And as I've done that for a year, I, you know, over the past few months, I've begun to sense and see some things I needed to do, change I needed to make, decisions I needed to make that have been the most challenging, I say the biggest challenges, most uncomfortable things um, that I've ever had to do. But I began to sense very clearly that the Lord was wanting us to go here. We needed to do this. And I'm not a good leader and a good pastor if I don't follow. 
And so over the past few months, I, I began to sense that we needed a change in staff. And so I notified Jonathan that we would be going in a different direction for our worship ministry. I understand that this type of news is, is unsettling. It's always unsettling. But what's amazing is since we have shared this time together and I shared this news, there have been some really valuable and positive conversations with Jonathan over the last few weeks regarding how God is using this, how he might be using this for good. I want to read for you just a portion of a note Jonathan sent this week to some of those he ministers most closely with. And this is quotations from Jonathan. Over the past several months, the Lord has been stirring our hearts for ministry to the poor in Lima. In consultation with our district leadership and Pastor Chip, we are receiving a blessing to do that work. And because we're doing that work, we are no longer going to be serving as the worship pastor at Lima Community following October 1st. We are following a call and what I believe to be the direction of the Holy Spirit. And so for me, walking through these waters of trying to lead you well, but then also becoming very aware that God is, it looks like God is up to something incredibly amazing. I would say I am so grateful for the work Jonathan has done over these last 10 years or so at Lima Community. We're gonna recognize those things over this month as he transitions from our staff to this new specific kingdom activity in the city of Lima. I am so excited about how the Lord is going to expand the kingdom footprint in Lima through Nazarene Partnerships. And so I wanted to share that with you today. This is what's going on. Um, feel very clear to do this. Don't know what that means. And then it seems like, wow, Lord, you always honor our obedience. And you, you are the one who knows the plans that we have for maximum impact where we're at. And so I want to share that with you today. And I want us to pray. And then um, we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you so much. For your Holy Spirit, who is so faithful. Father, I thank you for how you always know what we don't. You see what's best, and you lead us. Even sometimes when it's uncomfortable, very uncomfortable, when it's challenging sometimes. But Lord, all along, you're doing work that we can't even see. And Lord, we just glory in your and you being the head of our church and we follow you. Lord, we are excited and we're gonna share in coming weeks about what is going on in Jonathan's heart. And Lord, may you take us and as you shake us up a little bit, you do it for the purposes of doing something greater. And so Lord, we follow you unreservedly and completely, expecting great things for you. We remember the old missionary saying, attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. Lord, as we drove in this morning, the song, that old song, you're the God of this city, started playing, and we just know that what you're doing is, is incredible. And so, Lord, thank you. You're with us always. You're doing unbelievable things. Father, we realize that this is an adjustment for us, but Lord, we have expectant hope in the greater thing that you're doing. Lord, help us as we walk through this relationship series to allow our relationships to be led by thinking, not feeling, to allow feeling to come along in its proper place, but not to get sucked into patterns and habits and practices that cause dysfunction in our relationships. 
Help us to live truly with humility. Help us to live out of empathy, devotedness to one another, resolved for one another. Lord, make these the values and truths that overlay all of the relationships and guide our relationships. I pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Have a great week.